if you are going to hire the best taste buds in town or you're going to hire an absolutely brilliant advertising um, person or communications person, be clear about what you need them to do in terms of the brief, but you know, don't, don't hire Picasso and then tell them how to draw really, which often happens. Yeah. Mark, lovely of you to join us. Uh, shame you couldn't make it into the uh, studio. Um, a bit disappointed, but you are um, the other side of the world. So uh, we'll let I'll you forgive off. you. We'll let you off. Well, Brandt will let you off. I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, think about it. Anyway, uh, lovely to see you, Mark. Obviously, I've known you for a long, long time. Um, obviously, our paths have crossed initially at Green and Blacks and and then at Causton Press. Um, but obviously you've worked across so many other brands and businesses. Um, you might want to sort of give us a little brief introduction about uh, where you've been and what you do. Will do. Well, good to see you both. Um, it's definitely sunnier here in Melbourne than I think you've got in London. At all the right, moment. all right. So, no need to rub it thank in. You for, <laughs> thank you for asking me to join your no, thank you. podcast. So yes, just as a quick, very quick recap. So... I've spent my entire career in the food and drink business, predominantly in marketing, starting with bigger companies, worked for United Biscuits as a graduate trainee there on brands like Hula Hoops and Skips and McCoy's, then moved to work for Burger King in the UK and then began what I like to call the second half of my career, which is working for smaller, more emerging challenger brands and Michael, you mentioned you and I first met more than 20 years ago now yeah. at Green and Blacks, where I was the marketing director and you were responsible for the amazing tasting chocolate that we were fortunate to have for that brand. And we've also worked together on Causton Press. I, these days, have also invested in and support a number of other small food and drink brands. Uh, Ellie Brewery, which is a uh, non alcoholic drinks brand, uh, Forest Feast, which is a confectionery and snacking brand based in Belfast. And between then, also a stint as marketing director at pret for about five years, finishing in 2017. So interesting to get a perspective of working, I guess, on the retailer side rather than just as, as, a, as a manufacturer or brand owner, and to see how um, food and drink can work from um, an operator's point of view on the high street. Yeah, and just to that point where you just said at the end, the like you say, retail brands and, and sort of food service. What's the sort of what's the sort of some big differences or, or similarities you you saw in the sort of in those two roles with regards to marketing? Well, I, I think there are. I mean, brands can exist across both and can stand for similar values and similar have a similar ethos and similar quality. It's the way that those brands are delivered, I guess, and the experience of those brands is delivered that varies greatly. So on packaged goods brands, typically sold through somebody else's store or e-commerce or alternative channel, really you have far greater control over the um, the final product that people are, are buying and consuming. So the taste of the product, the look of the packaging, you don't fully control the pricing. But usually it's within you know a range of possibilities that um, you know work for the channels where you're, you're you're selling that brand. But usually the brand that comes off or the product that comes off a out of a kitchen or out of a production line is, is very much the product that people consume when they have it on the go or at home wherever they choose to consume that. The difference with a brand, a hospitality brand, or a um, food on the go brand like Pratt is the the brand ethos can also be about high quality freshness natural food for example but the delivery of that brand involves thousands of people every day um, and a number of tasks being done um, to that, if, that impact the quality of the delivery of that brand and that experience so i would say that the ability to deliver consistency in um, hospitality is far greater far more complicated and much more of the job goes around uh, recruiting brilliant teams, staff training and systems and simplicity and operational excellence, uh, whereas on packaged goods, you know, more things are controllable uh, more easily. Yeah, something you always talked about about Burger King is um, is getting that flame grilledness that, that some certain other burger brands don't get. That was one of your your main things. I remember you saying a lot of the time. In, 
Well, flame grilling will always taste better. <laughs> as I used to point out to you, Mike, but um, I mean, there's, a, there's a brand that obviously has huge global competitors, um, yeah. but does have a distinctive point of view around how it how it cooks its burgers, and getting that across was critical to their long term position in the market. Um, just to move on, to something else you said in your your sort of intro, the um, like you said, you've been at some large brands like like. Um, uh, United Biscuits and and, um, and Burger King and then sort of challenger brands such as Green and Blacks um, and then the sort of startup brands like LA Brewery. Can you give me some sort of, uh, give us some sort of examples of differences but also some of the similarities you see them because they're so, people might see them, see them as very different sort of entities but there must be sort of crossovers. Well, I think the crossovers really are around making sure that the, the product or the service that you're offering is is consistently delivered and has a a role within the marketplace where it's where it's competing. So every everybody, whether you're a big or small company, needs to have um you know have a clearly defined product proposition and a role in the category where you're choosing to compete. So all of those aspects are, are very similar. Big companies may spend much more time and much more money in you know, more carefully defining those, but they still need to be done irrespective of your of your size. I think the cultural aspects of the companies are probably where there's greatest difference yeah. in that if you're a startup or a small and emerging brand, I think in order to even survive and earn your, earn your place in the world, you know, you have to, you have to adopt a more uh, risk-taking approach in order to get anywhere. Cause if you don't, you may not be around in six months or yeah. 12 months. Whereas, understandably so, I think in big companies, the emphasis is often around, you know, brand management emphasis is oft, often around avoidance of risk rather than taking risk. Um, to brands that have, or companies that already have very established and successful products and brands, uh, or even whole divisions within their, within their entities, typically they're already very profitable, very, very successful, and they're really looking for organic growth, but no, no major surprises. Whereas in a startup, you know, surprises happen every day and you actually need those surprises in order to propel you forward. So I think the, big, the differences are more organizational than they are in you know, technical management of, um, mm. of products and brands. I think also the hierarchy that you have in a larger business as well, the amount of people above you that have to sign something off, you know, is, is, is what leads to that kind of risk averse nature because everybody's got to kind of approve something and then get it signed off by someone above them usually, especially if it's, if it's a larger campaign. I, 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 I did want to ask something around the agility as well, because I think that's something that I've seen and something that a lot of our clients at Tastehead will pick up on um, in terms of, you know, how quickly can we move? And we often talk about how, well, you know, even if something is going to take several months for us or as a startup, that might seem like a long time. But if you're at a larger business, it can sometimes take years. Because you've worked at so many different larger businesses, global corporations, and challenger brands and startups. Could you maybe just give us a, a sense of, of of the difference in in that kind of agility? Is it kind of, you, you, you know, sometimes what you can do um, in a startup that would take weeks, sometimes does take years. Is is, is it, is is the difference that wide or, or maybe not, not as much in your experience? I think that in, um, in FMCG or consumer packaged goods, however, you, you may describe it. The, the, I do think there is quite a difference between smaller um, startup type emerging brand cultures versus the corporate cultures. And, and often you are, you are selling those product through, products through and brands through third party distributors or wholesalers who have their own sort of timelines and systems. And then the corporation will have, you know, hundreds of salespeople that are, and, and operational people that are lined up against those business models. So any change is hugely disruptive. And mm. I think for, again, going back to retail and what, one of the reasons I enjoyed my time at Pret so much, I mean, Pret was a very, very big business these days, um, but was incredibly agile actually. And one of the reasons for that was it did control its own retail space. It was able to try things out and Actually, I, f I found it of all the places I've ever worked, the place where you could try things out the fastest was was Pret, and it was a near billion, you know, billion dollar turnover company with hundreds of restaurants and ten thousand staff. But it was able to, uh, you know, test in a very agile way, rather like a startup would test, you know, in one in one kitchen, test in a home kitchen, then test in one 
shop that was around the corner from that underneath the offices in Victoria. Try it for a few days, get some early reads on it. You know, hopefully there's some quick lessons and improvements you can make to iterate onto the next stage. Then maybe perhaps try it in two shops or three shops, and then try try changing the name, try changing the price, try changing the packaging, try changing the position on the shelves. Learn something from each of those things, and by the time you know you've done that, you work out whether there's any whether there's still any promise for that that product or that that idea and then by the time you're then taking it to a greater number of shops in their case you you've already taken a lot of the a lot of the pain out of the process and you've spotted a lot of the failings and fixed them before it goes it goes wider so i think there are examples of businesses that are big and can still be very agile but what they don't do is bet the whole farm on a piece of innovation they'll find a a nimble way of um, introducing something and testing it whilst the the mothership and the core operations continue to do their thing and make sure that they deliver the sales and the, and the excellence that you'd expect from a more mature you know, business that's got a very defined operation. Yeah. So it is possible, but it's, but it's hard, it's hard in big FMCG, I think, because you, to a degree, you're in the hands of um, retailers who stock your products, who don't operate in particularly agile ways. And they've got better than they used to be, but um they're not quick, generally speaking, particularly when it involves suppliers, third-party brands. Well, I, I think this is probably where some of the benefits of the DTC landscape kind of offer some of those same benefits that you've just explained with Pret. And also, it, it, so many of the startups that we work with um, do have to set up their own production facility, whether that's in a home kitchen initially, a shared kitchen, building their own facility. And they, they, they it's easy to just look at the downsides, but one of the massive upsides is that ability to be able to just make some tweaks and changes and use it as a testing ground. And if you couple that with the D2C model as well, especially in your first year or two, the amount of learnings and things you can try and just just developments and progress that you can make that if you were restricted to large volumes in a co-packer and distributors going into retailers and that was your only source of revenue, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that. Totally agree. And, and not just D2C brands, I think there's, you, you just need to find a, um, a friendly shopkeeper, so to speak, mm. who might, you know, maybe it's a farm shop or a deli, or yeah. if you're selling into pubs, maybe it's your local pub or whatever, but kind of avoid the head office, just go direct to the the outlet, ideally an independent where the owner's there and can probably allow those sort of things to happen and kind of go and camp there and test your test your idea. And, and I think, you know, most importantly, as the founder or the creator of a brand or a business, you know, you go and do that yourself, really, and you listen firsthand to the feedback you're getting. And then you can you don't have to re- you don't have to react to every single thing that a member of the general public says about your product, <laughs> but you know you need to be in list- you definitely need to be in listening mode and you need to interpret their their feedback. But I do think you can do that in traditional retail spaces as well. But you know if you're waiting around for Sainsbury's or Tesco to give you permission to try that in 400 stores, then you know life will pass you by. You yeah. need to sort of behave behave like an entrepreneur really and go and find. Yeah, go and find a friendly partner and give them some free stock and you know, create a bit of energy in their store. And they'll, they'll usually enjoy being part of mm. an experiment, particularly if you have an interesting emerging idea or product. Yeah. Everyone, everyone seems to, I mean, with friends and family, it's, they're always sort of saying, I'll try your latest chocolate, straight drink, straight whatever. You know, you, there's always willing punters out there, aren't there, to yeah. test your stuff. Um, that's been one of my, that's been one of my learns over the years. I mean, the food and drink business is just, one of those businesses that you know, every everybody loves to you know, try a new product or find out how things happen. So yeah, yeah, your your wider network of friends and family, or you know, maybe people through your children's school or their sports clubs. I mean, there's plenty of easy ways of doing yeah research that are actually quite quite good fun if they're done in the exactly in the right way. And they may not be you know scientifically robust, but they give they give you enough feedback that you can move yeah. forward. And I think that's the thing. Any any piece of research or learn or or testing it's just have it have i you may not have answered every question but have i got something from it that allows mm. me to uh, continually improve the concept and, and move it move it forward rather than move it around which is often what happens in classic research it's just and my experience of classic research is you know most things seems to test they all everything seems to test quite well but you know <laughs> no it won't all perform very well yeah but um no, exactly. sometimes it's better to do your own investigations and and also with that um, as as you've always said to me, 
is you know it's inexpensive and you said treat every pound as if it's your own pound when it comes to marketing whether it's research or or above the line activity it's like you know really think whether it's going to have some worth you know and by doing things like that which are relatively inexpensive you know rather yeah. than spending tens of thousands of pounds on some research i think I, is always useful yeah i mean i, I still subscribe to that and and, and that's not about um, penny pinching either because it no. just means that you know, when the big calls come and sometimes you, know, you might be asked the question, are you really sure that you should be spending half a million pounds or five million pounds on this marketing campaign? Yeah, treat it like your own money. And, you know, would I spend my own money on this? Have I done enough yeah. homework to know whether it's the right thing to do or not? So it's not always about doing things on the cheap. It's just about yeah. you know, having conviction and being sure that it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Um, I want to just move on to um, uh, sort of investment, really. So, you know, you you obviously started off in marketing, and then sort of went into sort of um, either uh, joining as a sort of director or founder in companies, and and part of that has been both investing personally, but also securing investment in in some of the brands you've worked with. So it'd be good to understand, you know, what you've learned, things that maybe are undervalued when seeking investment, or things that are overvalued. It'd be good to get your uh, your take on that. Well, I think. I'll put my investor hat on here rather nice. than my <laughs> found out. But I would I would say one of the most important things when doing a pitch to investors is, is not to demonstrate that you've already achieved big sales or you know, not, not to try and flatter pe- flatter your results, but to just be able to share with people what you've actually learned so far and therefore why what you're gonna do with the, the money that you're hoping to that you're hoping to raise. I mean I think see so many business plans where people have the and examples of other brands that have done really well and they say we want to move into this sector we need more money to do it give us the money but there's not really too much beyond the excitement there's not too much evidence that what they have is actually working or, or if it is working why it's working and and what they need that that money for so little little case studies rather like the research example we talked about you know where is the can, can you show me the reasons to believe so where mm-hmm. have you put this product or brand and it gives you the confidence um, that this is going to work? Not just that it tastes good or looks good, but that actually it's been sort of out in the wild and it's got, you've got some proof of uh, that this, this may work and is already starting to work, even if it's away from being the, the finished article. That, that's crucially important. And I, I'm also very reassured by people who you know, explain what hasn't worked and, and understand mm. why things haven't worked. And understanding why something works or why it doesn't work is super valuable, particularly if, as an investor, you're about to give somebody you know, cash to invest. You think, I'd rather give it to somebody that um, you know, re- really thinks about not, not just being careful with the money, but that it's really watching what's working and what's not mm. and adjusting, adjusting their course, course correcting along the way, making the right iterations and amendments rather than thinking that success starts and finishes with raising the money, which I think is sometimes the case. The other thing is, and it's a more financial thing, is just taking the emotion, taking the emotion away from this product tastes great or this packaging is great or so-and-so is written on social media about how much they like it, more to just looking at the finances. Yeah. And to Brant's earlier point, you know, is, is this addressable market? You know, is there room for us in this market? You know, if we... If this goes well, what, what is our business plan credible? You know, can we achieve a turnover of the sort of size that we're saying we can? If we were to achieve that turnover, would, would it require us to have, you know, would we have 1% of the market or actually does our plan, if we deliver it, require us to take 30% of the market, mm-hmm. in which case you might be more <laughs> suspicious around whether that's possible or not, or at least possible you know, with the funds that are being, are being raised. And then linked to that, it's just an understanding of the, we, we would call it the structural margins or the structural economics of um, of the product that's being um, being put forward for investment. So that's really the not not the bottom line profitability of the of the business because the reality is in the early days of food and drink companies it's incredibly difficult to get these things out of the blocks without losing money at the bottom 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 line. Being able to demonstrate that the price that you're selling the product at minus the cost of actually making the product and then minus any directly associated sales costs and those would be things like 
warehousing the product and getting it delivered mm. to your customers or the costs of funding a 20% off trial promotion or something like that with a, with a stockist. That after all of those things, that there is a viable, um, call it a contribution or a, or a margin, gross margin less those associated costs would normally be defined as a sort of a contribution figure, contribution to central overheads. And is, is that something that is going to get to a viable level such that if the business scales, it will be able to generate one day enough money of its own rather than be continually reliant on funding? Now, often the, the big thing in that calculation is that the cost of the product in the early days is very expensive to make because you're making you know, extremely small, inefficient production runs, for example, or you've only been able to print X thousand units of packaging, whereas if you could print 50,000 units, mm. the price falls down. So that you don't have to show that you've already hit the, um, you know, hit the magic numbers at the start, but you do have to be able to understand those economics and show that there's a credible path to a better margin when volume does, if and when volume does arrive. Um, you see a lot of business. I see a lot of business plans where the margin just transforms in year two, and then just keeps going up and up and up, and really getting under the skin of those numbers and understanding what those assumptions are. Yes. Yeah. Is important. I can I can sort of hear Jay McCardle, our trusty finance director at Corson, his his sort of voice in the back of my head talking about structural margins as well while you say all this. Who's he's always on yeah, about this, listen, isn't he? And in a good well, you really know, in the right way, you know. Absolutely. And you know, Joe does a great job of shining a light on that, you know, yeah. at, at Corson and, and pushing the team. And I think it but the reason for it though is that Rarely does a business work if you, even if you're careful with your cash, but you're not, if, if the structural margins are flawed, it doesn't matter how many, you know, how much you save on photocopiers or post-it notes or travel expenses or anything like that, it, it's not, it's not going to get you out of difficulty really. And it's also going to mean that later down the track when you might hope to perhaps raise more money for that business from the next type of investor or professional investor who can put larger sums in or indeed exit that business that you have a big problem because at that point, the various detailed due diligence processes that go on will probably highlight, you know, that problem if it, if it is a problem. Yeah. And <clears throat> obviously you've, you've talked, you know, not unsurprisingly about how the product and the numbers are really important. I would imagine another really important aspect is the founder or the founders and your relationship with them or who the kind of stakeholders are or people just kind of running the show. And I'm guessing there are certain traits that you look for, honesty, integrity, drive, et cetera. Is, is there a trait in particular that you really like to see when you're thinking about investing in a company? And are there any red flags? Do you sometimes, without wanting to put words in your mouth, do you sometimes see people that claim that they work, you know, they're workaholics and they work sort of all hours, you know, kind of to the middle of the night and weekends and everything? Do you worry about they might actually burn out. What 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 are your kind of what are the traits that you're looking for mostly in 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 a founder that you're thinking of investing in? Good prompt, Rant. Thank you on the team side because it's it's critical. Um, mm. And and, it, and I say team because I don't think it is all about the founder. Actually, I think it's if if we if we broaden this to talk about founder team or management team, whatever the startup team or early stage team is, I think. It's really important to ideally see the beginnings of a team rather than just a founder. That's important. Rather than the founder who thinks they're superwoman or superman and can do every single task themselves. That that's a concern when you meet a founder who thinks they're brilliant at everything or can or can do everything well enough. Um, yet to meet anybody like that. I've met some exceptionally talented people over the years, but most people are pretty bad at something and most founders are no, no exception to that so you found, found a team and I, th I think the big thing you're looking for in a founder you want someone that's they, they need to be in my, my opinion they need to be exceptional at one part of the job not everything so they might be you know a brilliant salesperson who just you know you know will get distribution of this product or brand or they need to be incredibly inventive and creative and have come up with I mean, if we talk about food and drink you know a, a new style of new style of food or, or or drink and done it in such a way that you know it really is a standout and distinctive product and they've, they've been able to inject that 
creativity or they are just super commercial strong on finance and operations that's that's fine too so i think a founder can come from any of those schools but you, you need a mix of everything in a successful team even in the early days and then in the early days you probably it's probably likely to be two people not 10 but mm. are those two people even if they're not covering off everything brilliantly are they you know are they able to cover the critical the critical functions or if they're both just creative talents that's a concern and if they're both accountants that's probably an even bigger concern you know that you need you need that rights that blend so you're looking for a founder who acknowledges that and isn't threatened by it and trying to and sort of embraces it really the fact that they might need help from someone that doesn't look like them mm -hmm. and, and on a more general level i think a founder who is able to listen that doesn't mean that they agree with everything but they can they can reflect think about things fight their corner but you know probably go home and have a have a long hard think about challenges they might have had and, and really form a balanced view as to whether they they dig in on a particular point or they're able to take a step back and perhaps consider things slightly differently and on, and on occasion they do need to dig in but just somebody that's just smart enough to be able to um reflect and think that way is is really important the founders that don't listen terrible they're usually the people that tell you they're usually the people that tell you that they listen to to everything as well but they're I think they're they're a red flag, in my opinion. Certainly, if I was investing. Very good. Um, I was going to switch over to something that we get asked quite a lot at, at, at Taste Ted is around agencies, mm. and um, mm. obviously, in your work over the years, you've worked with so many different agencies, whether it's design, PR, advertising, etc. So it'd be good to get a bit of insight from um, in that and any tips. Uh, or watch outs when dealing with agencies. Because I imagine you've also worked with some of the biggest and some of the smallest as well over your career. I have. Um, and bo both can be brilliant. Mm. So I think there's talents exist at all different sizes. I mean, I'm a huge fan of working with creative people. I mean, you guys clearly have that in spades on the food development side, but on the brand and communication side, there are many other disciplines and tal very talented creative people i think the the most important things if, if we're thinking more about smaller food and drink brands that are trying to find their way and, mm. and make a splash in the in the market i think you need to you need an agency or a per or it could be a person these days given the modern plural ways of working in freelancer mm. type communities some great freelance people out there so I would say you need the right creative partner. You don't necessarily need an agency, although an agency can also be a good bet sometimes, but you just need the right partner that's a good match for your needs. I think they, they need to be they need to be hungry for your business. That would be my you know, an important criteria rather than think they're doing you a favor because you haven't got much budget and you're a small brand. That That's just awkward from the get-go. So mm. as a client, you need to be able to pay people as best you can within your means um rather than trying to blag everything for free i think it's important to pay people yeah. and then you can hold them to account but obviously you don't have the big budgets of some of your bigger rivals all of the time so you have to cut the cloth accordingly with who you might work with the so someone that's hungry i would say somebody that's got a very f so, or a relationship where you're able to talk to the person that's actually doing the creative work rather than just talk to the people that are managing the process and that's not being disrespectful to people that are in, in ad agencies. They they be called the account managers or yeah. or the planners because they're they're all important and often very super talented people. But on a small brand, I don't, I don't think you you need a complicated process. You need to get face to face with the people that are actually doing the work, and you need to be able to share your vision, your opportunity, and indeed your the problem you that you need a creative solution for, you know, and you need to be able to talk direct to the the people that are going to be actually doing your work. And that, that's not always the most senior person in the agency, but it is talking to the person that's doing the creative work and, and having a face-to-face -face conversation with them rather than them being sort of a mysterious character behind the scenes that the account manager never allows you to to meet. So a direct a direct relationship's really important. I, li I like it when the people that have done the work present their work. Yeah. Some of them are 
some people are very happy on their feet presenting, others less so. It doesn't really matter, but the chance for them to hear the feedback direct, you know, if they've done the work, why, why should they hear it through a third party? Really? Why can't they be part of the conversation? Because they've probably worried about it a lot more than others in the room. So I, I personally like to have a relationship with a partner or an agency that's hungry for the brief and the business rather than seeing it as it's an interesting side gig that they're doing as a bit of a favor. So someone who really wants it, somebody who is creatively talented and is going to be, you know, have, you're going to have direct access to that person and you can talk, talk to them rather than through intermediaries, which is often the case in bigger agencies. Mm. In bigger agencies are famous for in the pitch meeting, you meet all of the senior people and then you never really see them again yeah. until you fall out with them and then they pop back up again. <laughs> so to, talking to the people that are going to be working on your business, really important. Do, do you, can you, can you feel a bit of chemistry with them? You know, are, are they, are they, are they up for the task and interested enough in the brief to, to do their best work? And, and then I think a lot of the success factors are about the client as much as they are about um, the creative partner. So have, has the client worked hard enough on the brief? Have they really organized their thoughts and their needs? It's, it's so important to get the brief right. It doesn't have to be a 20-page document. In fact, the best ones are usually very short, but they really do get to the heart of the of the, of the creative challenge and express it very clearly. Otherwise, I mean, it is literally like turning up a, you know, it's like flagging down a London black cab, getting in and not being clear where you're going. Mm -hmm. And the agency just drives around, puts the meter on, then you get really pissed off because the bill at the end when they drop you off is too expensive and they probably dropped you off in the wrong place at the same time. But that's probably because you haven't been clear on the brief in the first place. Yeah. So getting, getting that right is really important. And then also, if you are going to hire the best case buds in town, or you're going to hire an absolutely brilliant advertising um, person or communications person, be clear about what you need them to do in terms of the brief. But you know, don't don't hire Picasso and then tell them how to draw. Really, which often happens. Yeah. Now, give them space to give them space to do their creative best, but just be sure that when you're judging the work, it's actually addressing the challenge in the brief and, and try and go back and be sure whether the work's addressing that, that I, challenge. But there are, a lot, there are a lot of people that hire creative people and then tell them how to do it. Which I, pro I probably do that from time to time, so I apologize to anyone that's had that <laughs> experience, but I can only imagine how annoying, how annoying it would be. So a counsel would be for us, for us marketing people to be clear on what we're looking for in terms of and people would say, well, what, what is that? That's not about us saying what color things should be or what font size or exactly how they should taste. But it is about being clear who we're targeting and why, what our, our products or brand uh, needs to stand for and how it's positioned versus the, versus the competitors. Those are the things we need to be firm on and then let creative people do the bit we can't do. I really like the two points you made in the middle there. Made me smile. The one around getting the creative person in the room and having some direct kind of dialogue and feedback with them and also getting the brief right. And I think the reason that those two are so important, especially in things like branding and marketing and so on, is because unlike actually with the food and drink side of things, we actually have something quite tangible in front of us that everyone can taste and agree on and feedback. And sure, it's still quite subjective about what people want, et cetera. But when it's something that's even more, you know, you know isn't, isn't really tangible, especially initially when you're talking about the idea of a rebrand or a marketing campaign people think that what they've got in their head is all being downloaded very clearly in a few sentences yeah. and then they're really surprised when people have interpreted it a different way but that's just because i think as we've got more involved in things like you know brand positioning projects and, and so on i've just seen it time and time again that people just that they, they almost they gesture they start saying things like you, you know you know what I mean don't you and you're like no you've got to really describe this <laughs> but, you know people you, you people feel like their thoughts are being sort of read almost that they're really clear with a few words but actually just that that room for people to interpret things slightly different is yeah. is enormous. Um, I would also say though that that exactly the same thing although it is a bit more tangible but talking to the people who are doing the stuff is the same with what we're doing the product development whenever i work when i worked at green and blacks and now at course and 
when I'm working with a factory, so a third party manufacturing, I want to be talking to the person who's leading the the, the product commerce commercialization over there, mm. not some yeah. You know, like you say, it's fine talking to the account manager or whatever, but I want to have that face-to-face because not only are you going to get the product you want, but it's so much more, so so much quicker as well to get to the, the final point. So I think there, there's definitely a, a mirroring in mm. that as well. Yeah. Um, so to continue that sort of start, the, 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 you know, working with the agencies, but, you know, now onto the, the sort of what they do. So, Obviously, you've worked with a lot of the traditional above the line um, marketing channels, so uh, print, PR, TV, um, posters, etc. On on cross track on tube, and but obviously now there's there's far more uh, of the media uh, and communication is social media and influencers. Um, be good to hear your thoughts on um, on this change and um, how you think it will change over the next five to ten years maybe what your experience is of it i think that what you've just described are really in my mind they're, cha- they're channels yeah and they're, they're choices as to you know, different ways of getting your message out there whether it's sponsorship or promotional work pr social media packaging advertising and then there's also forms of different media within each of those so there are more channels than ever. There is no denying that. I think there's a terrific pressure on marketing people to be active in every channel when actually you don't, you don't need to be active in every channel. So saying no to a few of the channels is perfectly okay because it's actually a full-time job almost keeping up with just the administration and housekeeping of some of those channels. And it certainly wasn't a problem that our people that were doing marketing 20 or 30 years ago had to, had to deal with. They had far fewer choices. But if we if we treat those things as channels, they are they're, they're really all still reliant on a on a good I like to call it an organizing idea. That's the message, let's say the message that your brand puts out there. So what are what are we actually trying to say? How do we look and feel? How do we sound? What's our message? That central organizing thought that a brand might have, that that's still the real skill, I think, being able to uh, describe your brand and position it in the marketplace um, that way. And then you have a choice of tactics as to how to distribute that message through the channels. And I think what I see happening now is people starting with the channels rather than the idea. And the real value is getting the, the overarching idea to be super sharp and smart and then being choiceful around the channels where you choose to you know reach the target audience. But the marketing strategy for influencers or social media or PR or advertising should still ladder up really to the same brand idea and central thought. They're just different ways of accessing um, the target audience and different formats of delivering that message. It's quite exciting, really, if you think about the different ways and speed and cost options that you now have to get messages out there, far more flexibility and agility than we've ever had before. But people are so busy doing that that often uh, I think the quality of the central message and the crafting of that is um perhaps not as sharp as it used to be okay from brands particularly brands that are starting out because kind of you know anybody can kind of go live on social media really no barriers to entry you don't really need a big budget but you, before you know it, you can be pretty busy populating your your channels and, and the quality of what you're putting out there you know maybe a bit suspect that's not to say that everything has to be brilliantly choreographed because clearly social media is much more fast moving than that and it's like a live channel but is it relevant for your brand and yeah. the audience that you're targeting and is enough time spent on the central thought before yeah. you get busy doing all the executing I, I think you do hear conflicting ideas because a lot of people will tell you that just to grow a social media channel which they're probably not referring to brands it's probably more for personal reasons they say just keep doing content be consistent more and more content and I think people hear that and they think that that applies to brands as well but Mm. I think you've got to look at every piece of content that you do as a brand and 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 think is is this is this at least matching if not exceeding people's expectations of, of of the brand and how it performs because I would argue yeah. nothing's worth damaging the brand equity that you've worked so hard to build up just to get a little bit more frequency and get a few more followers. 
that's true. I guess if you're, I guess if you're central organizing idea or your brand idea, let's take a food brand. We might say that it's a good quality, but com- commodity type product. Take something like beans, because there's a live example in the market of a good brand doing that at the moment. I think um, that you know that that product's good. It's a good product, but somebody else could come up with the same product and stick it in a stick it in a similar jar. But it's the the brand idea is about inspiring people to use those beans. Therefore, the yeah. marketing strategy is invariably content hungry. Lots of recipes, lots of stimulating content. You know, high frequency energy doesn't have to be high production values all of the time. Just sparking people's ideas and staying front of mind. But that that is the marketing approach for that brand. That's their central way of doing it. Sounds like bold beans you're talking about there, Mark. That's that's exactly. Yeah, right. had, had those Mark, only we, yesterday. Yeah, I've got a cupboard well, full of them. We've both been we've both been fortunate to meet Amelia yeah. in recent weeks. He's the entrepreneur behind that but you know she has a very clear approach for that brand which just is to treat is to treat her brand more like a food magazine almost yeah and just to generate content so there's an example where i'd say producing vast amounts of content with social media almost as the lead channel is super smart but she's not spending money on doing tv advertising mm. or posters or, but she's also know, very she's made an active choice she's very comfortable doing that as well and i think that's important is that yeah, you know she's true. the founder but she she's mm. naturally going towards that sort of uh that way of I, marketing I, I feel like we have a victim here to invite to the podcast <laughs> yes in the future uh, yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly um mark i just wanted to move on to your your sort of international experience you're a bit of a globe trotter when it comes to work and where you've traveled and like to understand a bit more about your thoughts on the sort of food and drink industry um, across the world. I mean, now obviously you're in Australia, uh, you've worked in, uh, you know, uh, America and, and, and across Europe with brands. So yeah, it'd be good to understand your thoughts um, about where, where the difference is now, but also maybe some thoughts where, where it's going to in the future. Let's perhaps use Pret to illustrate that, because yeah. that would be a good example of a, of a business so. that you know, the UK, definitely the, the home market for prep, particularly London, where it, where it started out and has most of its, most of its shops. Um, prep moved into several international markets, but if, if I reference a couple, I mean, America, America was probably the most high profile of those, we should talk about France in a minute as well, but Amer- America was the, the sort of biggest, the biggest bet and you know, the concept of good food on the go for busy workers in city locations was exactly the same in London as it mm. was in New, in New York and other cities in in the US. The competitive set was different in each market. I don't just mean the names above the door, but culturally it was different. In, the, in every block of Manhattan, there's kind of a fantastic independent. They might be a salad place or a burrito place or a sushi place, but, you know, people really do respect the... The, the local operators and they were of a higher standard than perhaps the independent sandwich shops might have been in London yeah. a few years ago where Pret was able to sort of professionalize and take that idea on. So the competitors weren't just the big branded chains. They were, they were different, but the, but the consumer need is the same, but then there are just a few things that are, it doesn't matter what you want your brand to do. You have to, I think you have to, we used, we used to say one voice, local accent. So how do you behave as a brand? But just, Make sure that you're relevant around here, wherever you may be. And for Pret, that was things like, you know, the salads that Pret sold more salads in New York than it did in London in terms of, as a portion of its mix. But having um, a choice of dressings with the salad was critically important for American mm. customers rather than you determining what the dressing should be mm. for that salad. So the dressings were sold separately, and that was a difference in the way we sold salads in New York rather than, than London. And then on our coffee offering there was a far greater propensity in um in the us for filter coffee or drip coffee as it's called in the us uh, whereas the uk market had moved very aggressively towards espresso based coffees flat whites and lattes and cappuccinos and the like so we had uh, self-serve filter coffee stations in many of the us stores where people could help themselves and customize them with their choice of coffee creamer um there and we also had a far greater prevalence of cold coffee so coffee served over ice mm. not just in the peak summer months but as an all year round all time of day 
option. So same offer, really, as in coffee and food, but delivered with enough local sensitivity that you are relevant in wherever you choose to operate. And then in Paris, when the brand opened in Paris, I think Paris has the highest sales of desserts of any prep market in the world. So cakes and patisserie desserts all sell extremely well in prep Paris stores. Um, and the co- and the coffee experience there was Parisians still like to have breakfast at home as a general rule. So there were slower sales in the shops in terms of commuters grabbing breakfast on the run in the morning. Uh, but actually the coffee sales were very high at lunchtime. But people like to enjoy an espresso after their sandwich or their mm. salad, but they didn't want that espresso to be given to them at the same time they paid for their sandwich or their salad. They wanted it just as they'd finished their, their food. So there's a different operational challenge around how do you allow the customer to order and pay for that, but then find a way of um, making sure they have you know, a perfect temperature yeah. espresso when they, when they want it, which is really different to London when it was milk-based drinks predominantly served served at speed uh and more often than not taken away rather than people sitting down and enjoying on premise so that's one brand same set of promises in terms of everything it stands for around freshly prepared good natural food and organic coffee but with some alterations in terms of its um delivery of the brand in in local markets and my, my learning over the year is to you, you, you need to be strong you need you need to be strong on the brand otherwise you may as well not have a brand because you'd just be doing everything exactly the same as every local so you know have a have a kind of consistent brand look and feel and 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 voice but be respectful of local deeply rooted cultural traditions because it's hard yards if you don't comply with any of that because you just become too intimidating and less relevant for the local audience so getting that balance right of mm. global consistency versus local touch super important and then on the great and then on grocery supermarket type environments um i would say around the world it's pretty it's pretty similar in the at the point where people buy the products you know customers tend to buy them off similar looking from similar looking stores who have similar looking layouts and the approach of getting your brand through their supply chains is, 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 is pretty similar really in most markets around the world. So I see less difference in, in grocery than I see in food retail. Good stuff. Um, one, one more question before we sort of get onto the, the wrap up questions that we, we ask everyone, um, just be good to get a, a, an idea of, uh, what your thoughts are on the, on the future economic environment. Obviously there's been a lot going on over the last few years with COVID, with Brexit, um, and, 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 and just the general sort of, uh, cost of living crisis over here. Um, it'd be good to understand what you sort of, how you feel this might impact, uh, businesses, um, food and drink businesses particularly. Well, I think the history would suggest that food and drink is not a bad place to be during difficult economic times. And in fact, some categories perform traditionally perform very well in tough economic times. I think chocolate is one of those where people still, you know, enjoy their chocolate treat, even if times are generally, generally tougher. So food and drink is not, it's not, it's not a bad place, bad place to be. People tend to go out less, I think we can expect that to continue. Um, so people will be looking to save money perhaps on, you know, an extra night out a week or, or restaurant trip. So that, I think that challenge will, will exist, but with that comes an opportunity for people to perhaps not spend the amount of money they might spend on a restaurant visit, but to maybe make their home experience a little bit more special. And we saw some of those trends happening during the pandemic, I guess, when yeah. people were at home more and being more adventurous with their, with their choices. So I think, I think we can expect to see some of that. There is definitely a, on products where there isn't really any notable point of difference, there is a trading down taking place, which is well publicized around the world, but certainly in the UK, um, of customers switching from some branded products into private label where they really Mm. can't justify the price difference. But Mm. I guess that's the acid test for brand owners as to whether their product is, you know, is really 
is really worth the extra extra price if indeed they are charging an extra price versus yeah versus private label but is it demonstrably different and worth paying more for i think that will be a question that many customers continue to ask maybe even they're probably already asking it and i think we can expect them to continue to do that yeah to next year i think i think where the economic situation is trickier it's probably less around consumption i think the consumption will generally will generally hold up even if the mix of what people are buying shifts slightly but the the cost the, the cost of operating are really the the challenges for businesses so i can't think of any food and drink business that i'm aware of or at least close to the numbers of that hasn't faced very material challenges around the cost of goods in recent years if anything some of those pressures are starting to not go away but ease very slightly versus what we saw 18 months two years ago sort of in the pa- pandemic and supply chain interruption sort of eye of the storm so that's getting a bit better but i think anybody that's hoping that things are just going to flick back to pre-pandemic levels is probably being overly optimistic so i think we're in a new reality of the true cost of food mm. ingredients costs are not you know, not just suddenly going to bounce back to pre-pandemic levels and you know maybe in the round some of this is not a bad thing because people will realize that some of the food we've been consuming has been um you know has been available too cheaply really and that people in the supply chains responsible for growing and making that food have not had their fair share yeah at the spoil so there may have been a bit of good healthy natural correction there that's a long-term mm. yeah I mean, benefit the, for, every, for everybody the the, the the amount that we spend as part of our income on food and drink now is that much less than it was in the past. I mean, that's just sort of a well-known thing, and that's because the cost of food and drink has just gone down and down and down. Um, and, yeah, like you say, it needs to needs to sort of re-stabilise, as it were, I think. Mm. I, think it's a knob. I think I think so, and I, I observe that, you know, having I've lived in Australia for just over a year now, but I think the the cost of food here is, is, is definitely higher in terms of grocery yeah. shopping and the prevalence, obviously, because geographically we're... Australia is it, it um the local food movement here is just you know way way stronger yeah and um customers are extremely loyal to local producers and brands and prepared to pay more for certainly for certainly for meat and produce that that's yeah. the case um a little bit more challenge around packaged goods but where there's a direct right where there's a direct link to a a primary ingredient i think people are realizing that you know, there is a higher cost to some of those items and that's yeah. why they should cost more. So that, that is a difference between the markets. But the, the the broader impact of all of these cost of goods pressures is that people's, we talked about margins at the start of this conversation. And, mm-hmm. you know, people's, people that, people have had, they've had a lot of inflation to deal with in terms of the, pri- the price that people are paying for, for goods in the shops in the last few years. People have adjusted to that somewhat, but don't don't like it. And at the same time, they've got less cash in their pockets to yeah. to spend. So it's difficult for brands to just push all of that increase yeah. through yeah. all of the time. Uh, there is a limit as to how much you can do. So what's what's happening is people's gross margins or their contribution to central overhead is more often than not is a few margin points back than it was yeah. versus three or four years ago. I see that as a consistent theme. And the net impact of that is customers need to, sorry, companies need to be more efficient in the way they run their businesses. So more efficient with their marketing spend and their general overheads. And, you know, just be sure that their investment in teams and people is working as hard as it, um, hard as it can be. Yep. It's things that things are tighter mm. and it's more challenging because of those conditions to get people to invest in food and drink businesses right now. So I think they're seen as steady businesses in terms of reliability of sales, but challenging businesses in terms of level of profitability that food and drink businesses are currently able to produce. So for anybody raising money or seeking to raise money right now, you know, the climate is probably the most difficult I've known since I've been in the yeah. food and drink industry. Mm, yeah. That's the rea- that is the reality of it. Yeah. That's not to put anybody off, but mm. 
will mean that you know the, be- the I'm sure that the better ideas will still secure funding, but I think there will be less money around for me too. Yeah. ideas even if people think they're greatly different they're not really that different or adding any great value it'll be harder to raise funds well we've certainly seen over the recent years uh, the, the the amount of inquiries and the, the brands that we work with that go on to have sort of the initial success that the brands we've worked on in the last let's say three four years have had is usually there's some level of kind of good for you good for the planet some sort of functionality yeah. that they've, 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 they've got to come in and do more than just be a great tasting product at a good price point with a brand that people like. Yes. People just expect so much more mm. from their food and beverage products now than they did a decade or two ago. And rightfully so, because mm. I think it's it, it's the startups and the challenger brands that have that opportunity to to sort of fly the flag, to educate people, to to to, to start making the shift that you're talking about, Mark, I think. Yeah, I'd agree. We talked we didn't um we didn't cover it earlier, but just when you asked me about investment. Mm. micro and what you might look for in a i think the other the other thing i should have said is the ability of the founder or people seeking the money to not just describe their the taste of their product or the look of their product but be really clear about what's in it for their for the retail customers Mm. for the trade Mm. customers so now that's often described as what's your category proposition or your category story because buyers will be presented with all sorts of products and they, they might think that a particular product is slightly better than one they've already got, but is it really worth them making the effort and energy to change something out? You probably think as the entrepreneur, of course it is, but mm. these are busy people, There's huge amounts of change to change throughout every department in a big retailer to change a product from one supplier to another and all the complexity that brings. So it's got to be worth their while and worth their effort. So what's your category story? How are you? How is your business plan or your brand or your product? How is it? adding value yeah. to the category that that's a critical it's always been a critical question that but i think it's even more critical now because i just think the retailers are in a mode of probably steering more towards simplification off the back of what has been very choppy waters and a really turbulent time around supply chain and cost of goods so they are doubling doubling down really on the on the safe bets and being more risk averse on the emerging areas. I think, you know, the cycle, there's always cycle, these things are always cyclical and there will be a greater appetite will return for innovation and new ideas. But, um, I think they will be more selective certainly as we come through the end of this year and through next, I think people will go gently on that as they start to hopefully regain a bit more confidence in the economy. But, yeah. uh, there, there just isn't room for, lots of me too products that may be as good as things that already exist but don't really add any incremental net gains to the retailers yeah well mark i've literally watched the video uh, the window behind you um through the video feed during this call go from daytime <laughs> to nighttime so i know it's very late with you we've got a few wrap-up yeah. questions but feel free to just give us some quick fire answers because yeah i appreciate it. it's late for you yeah so all right no problem so uh the first one we ask all our I'll interview ease these. Uh, which other brands inspire you most? And that could be either food or non-food. Anything in particular? Well, they have had good plaudits in recent weeks, certainly from the marketing industry, which I still watch closely back in the UK. But uh, Guinness would be mm, yeah. a brand I would admire um, because I think they have so many distinctive assets right rooted in the product itself, but the rituals around the serve, um, they're brilliantly consistent marketing and communication. And I think their their conviction when they do anything new and their, their launch of their of Guinness Zero is yeah. very simple, but again, yeah. to- great execution. And I think, you know, they're rightly getting uh, they've just been, they've put on a huge amount of growth in the last couple of years. Yeah. And I love that but I Distinctive brand assets and long-term application of those, yet somehow they still feel fresh and relevant rather than a, an, mm. an old person's drink. They feel every bit as relevant for young drinkers and coming up. So I like that brand a lot. Brand, brand and I are big fans. Oh, I'm having to stop myself. We could literally do a whole episode about how amazing the brand is. They're a brand of the you millennium. Should. I, should I was, be. Yeah, well, obviously I'm married, I'm married to, a, to an Irish girl, um, Mark, and um, we were over in, in Dublin for the second time. In, in recent years at the storehouse and you just get the sense and 
all of the adverts and the assets they have, but they have it all. They have the product. And and what I love about them is they've not they've not grown sort of too quickly. They could easily have tried to probably sponsor the Football World Cup, but they stayed in rugby. They sort of they protected their positioning quite well. They mm. didn't sort of, even though they've grown to be enormous, I feel that they they did it in the right way as well. Yeah. Good things come to those who wait. There you go. <laughs> <Some Exactly. might> <laughs> but they are um they're a masterclass, I think. Mm. for everybody to everybody to learn from really terrific as a marketeer admire them greatly i um, mean outside of food and drink there was a new opening of a um in, in our part of the world of a, of a new lego store here a couple of weeks okay. ago mm. i think i think leg i think lego is a tremendous brand mm. I like the way that they've managed to kind of secure relevance all these years on and multi-generational appeal i like the way they've kind of had the central brand organizing idea of imagination and play or however they described it but they've been able to do that through their traditional bricks but also you know the, the tv series with the lego man or lego yeah. master whatever it's whatever it's called great their adoption of third party movie licenses and and third-party properties to keep them relevant and and fresh in terms of tying up with the latest entertainment content the way they've managed to have really experiential brilliant shops yeah uh, on the high street yet yeah, they're leading edge e-commerce and digital brand just think they're a, another an old favorite but that's that i think an old favorite who have distinctive assets and a long-term positioning but have continue to make it fresh and relevant for the times and for a new generation of customers so guinness and lego you can't go too far and, and with lego this. it's the age range that they span as well because we're doing yes. we've just done the list for santa for oscar's christmas mm. present list and i was saying to jem oh you know let's get some lego on there she said oh, he, he's not really fussed about the lego he's probably still young he's three years old i said yeah but i want to build something out of lego <laughs> on christmas day even if he just gets to play with the final thing yeah i mean uh my daughter, we, we bought her Lego over a number of years. She eventually gave it all away, which was great to a, a younger girl. But the last one we got her, which she still has in the room, is the Seinfeld set in Lego. <laughs> and that's that was the sort of last bit of Lego she had. So nice. it, it does like span ages, I said. Um, best piece of advice you've received in your career, Mark? I mean, it probably came from me, but have you had any others? <laughs> Any other wise, any other wise words yeah. after Guinness? Um, <laughs> I would gave me a great piece of advice early on, which whatever role you're doing, make sure you follow an idiot. I thought that was a great piece of advice. <laughs> so look, look, look like take, take the role, of, take a role where someone not so talented as, yeah. or not not so smart has um, has done it before you. But no, on a serious note, I would say somebody told me very early in my career that there was more fun to be had working for um well not working for a market leader which has suited me well because i've always been happy and not working for sort of the the status quo even if it's meant working for smaller companies and they, and they said that you know, the best marketing jobs are go go and work somewhere on a brand that's declining and try and do a turnaround and apply mm -hmm. a turnaround mm -hmm. mentality or go and work on a brand that's a, a scrappy brand that unless it tries new things and really fights harder um against a big incumbent it um it won't make any progress but it was more fun to be had working in those scrappier environments and i've always that's always stuck with me and i think guided many of the choices that that i've made either that or i've become totally unemployable by big market leading brands which is probably <laughs> also partly true but i do think there's more fun to be had in those you know number two challenger or something to prove type businesses Excellent. Um, we're really uh, going to round up now. One more for you. Um, have you got a book, podcast, or any other resource that you'd like to recommend to the listener? Anything you you apart listen to on a daily basis? We're big fans of podcasts, for instance. Hmm. Even listen to the, our own. Apart from the uh, <laughs> apart from the Wolverhampton Wanderers daily updates, um, <laughs> I well, I tell you, there's a there's a book that um, I've recommended to a number of people, which is um, I probably get this slightly wrong, but I think it was called uh, "This Shit Will Never Sell" or "This Shit yeah, Won't Sell." That. David Gluckman, that. yeah, yeah, David Gluckman, yeah. So, I'd like to think I was one of the early influences for his book. But having spoken <laughs> to David, I mean, for those that don't know, he 
he was around in the god i'm, I'm gonna probably get this wrong 70s and 80s maybe yeah i think you're right yeah, yeah, yeah. where he was um working for big drinks companies but working in a sort of what sounded like a hybrid innovation and marketing role being responsible for creating um some of the brand some of the emerging brands for those businesses or new brands for those businesses that are household names today with Bailey's probably being the Bailey's mm. Irish liqueur being the most famous of those, but it's a great, well, it's a great read if you're interested in brands full stop. It's not particularly um, academic, but I think what it, what it really does is gets into the, what's the heart of the idea and the story that those brands have and that, around which the positioning is built. So I think it's a, it's a great it's a great read that's really about you know the heart and soul of marketing before you get into the textbook side of it and i thoroughly yeah. enjoyed that book yeah i'd also say follow him on on linkedin as well because yes. he, he posts regularly and he's often posting insights about campaigns that didn't work or things yeah. that did work but just kind of yeah really insightful great posts on linkedin so definitely worth he following. sent um he very kindly sent me a note a few years ago um which i think is the first time i kind of been aware of him or, or met him to say how much he, he discovered Corston Press rhubarb and how much he'd um, enjoyed it but more importantly how he thought the words that we wrote on the front of the packaging were to be admired because we had deliciously tart written yeah. very prominently on the packaging and he's his, his whole philosophy is around you know describe a product exactly as it is rather than using Land mm, language, mm, so yeah, mm. tart. A tart recipe may put many people off, but it also is so truthful around that sort of sweet and tart combo that um, that particular drink has. So he, he's a great champion of sort of same. going against the conventions yeah. and you know less samey, celebrate your differences, all of that type of of yeah. thing. So we've had a bit of communication ever since that. Oh, that's but, good. Uh, so I'm now an official recommender of his book, no <laughs> commission. <laughs> Well, look, Mark, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Australia. It's been a, a very good chat. Um, can't wait to see you when you're back in the UK, hopefully after Christmas sometime. And uh, enjoy Indeed, yeah. enjoy your Barbie on the beach. I'm sure you'll have something like that as you do in Australia. Obviously, I don't agree with that sort of nonsense, but um, I suppose you have to go along no, with it. Well, I shall, I shall embrace a hybrid Australian <laughs> and UK Christmas lunch <laughs> so I'm, I, I should be insisting as I always do that we have prawn cocktail just to fly the flag <laughs> and hot crisps I traditions. hope maybe you never know <laughs> certainly be hot right great to see you both yeah. and um, thanks, have a Mark. good Christmas you Cheers, too Mark. thanks a lot thank you for listening if you enjoyed this episode please like and subscribe and for more information please visit tastehead.com we hope you join us for our next episode